Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Fit RX. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis, and I am very excited uh, about this episode um, because I feel like I'm going to learn something new today. So uh, many of you know, I'm always reading and just researching kind of new stuff. And a lot of it in this field seems to be, you know, kind of the same old stuff, which is all good things. But every now and then I'll come across something that's kind of new and exciting. And that's what I feel like I've found with this. Um, and so we're going to talk today all about the mineral copper. And um, I have recently just discovered the potential kind of health benefits about copper. And I always love it when uh, somebody just kind of pours their life into researching something and becomes uh, an expert on it. I mean, in, in this day that uh, information age that we live in, anybody can become an expert on something uh, if they put enough time into it. I mean, you know, that information is available. And so uh, that's exactly what my, my next guest has done. Mr. Jason Hommel. Am I saying your name, right? That's right. Hommel, Jason. Hommel. All right. Uh, so I'll let him kind of tell his story, but uh, he has, um, just really become an expert with this particular mineral, um, among other things. And he wrote a book called The Copper Revolution, uh, which he goes in depth uh, and, and uh, quotes uh, numerous studies about the effects of copper. And so we are going to talk to him about that today. Uh, so Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is always, uh, I love these shows. Well, all right. Well, first, I guess, tell us how in the world you uh, got to this point of um, of figuring out copper. I mean, it seems kind of random. It's just a, a random mineral that's out there that um, I certainly never learned anything about in medical school. They don't teach us, well, really anything about nutrition, but let alone minerals in particular. Mm -hmm. But But what made you hone in on copper and then go on to write a whole book about it? So my, my brother would tell the story slightly differently than I would, but I'll, I'll use some of his language. And he said, uh, gosh, you took so many of these minerals and supplements that you gave yourself a copper deficiency. Way to go, idiot, you know? <laughs> and that's, it's not too far off the mark, okay? Because what happened is I did, I did the uh, high iodine protocol, which has iodine and selenium and magnesium uh, and quite a few other things like salt, um, to excess and uh, uh, B vitamins. I took vitamin C regularly, but I decided to add some boron too and MSM sulfur. Um, I was also taking some copper and some zinc, um, but I just noticed that the copper was making me a little nauseated. And I decided to trust my gut one day and said, well, I've had enough of this copper for you know a couple of years. So let's just stop the copper and see what happens. I had heard that copper stops bleeding and I've had, I have a bleeding disorder. So I figured I couldn't do myself two minutes damage because of copper deficiency hit. It would show up with my superpower. I'd start bleeding again and getting nosebleeds and I'd find my way back. That was kind of a dumb mistake. I did dumb thing on top of dumb thing because I was really, I was doing a lot of things that was depleting my copper, uh, excessive sweating, excessive exercise, all the other vitamins and minerals I'm taking. A lot of those can deplete copper. And I was taking them at high levels. Uh, high iodine, and I was even taking potassium iodine, uh, pota sorry, potassium iodide, and um, MSM sulfur can lower copper, the B vitamins maybe can lower copper, like niacin. Um, I don't think boron lowers copper, but uh, magnesium can deplete copper, vitamin C can deplete copper, zinc can deplete copper, uh, a turmeric can deplete copper, and I was eating a lot of turmeric. And so, Anyways, I just stopped taking copper because it was making me nauseated. And um, I ended up fainting, still couldn't figure out what the problem was. I ended up getting very sleepy during the day, very tired, like narcolepsy kind of sleeping. Like I felt scared to leave the house to even do errands. Uh, I couldn't figure out what was happening. Um, and so finally I, I found my way back to copper. And when I did, I was like, this copper, I think, is doing a lot of good for me. Um, but why can't we take more than 10 milligrams? I thought I had done my research because I'd read the government in, uh, information that says uh, 
uh, the RDA is 0 0.9 milligrams, the upper limit is 10 milligrams. And I really wanted to look into the reason for why the 10 milligrams was the upper limit, because I felt like I wanted to take more. So I did my research for a couple of months and I found out that the upper limit, it was set because that's the limit at which no liver damage is found. And that was a weird language. It didn't make sense to me because I was a former alcoholic <laughs> and I've been using painkillers for many, most of my life for arthritis and those don't work. And I'm like, well, those cause liver damage. What's the uh, amount of copper that would be the equivalent of a beer or two? or even 10 beers, or what's the amount of copper would it be the equivalent to, you know, a, a couple painkillers? And the there's no good answer for that because the government in 1993, when it set its upper limit, said that we would we should do further research to determine um, at what level liver damage happens, and they've never done any of that further research in the last 29 years. So then I was like, well, how do they know that even liver damage is a problem? Oh, from animal studies. Okay, well, great. What are those animal studies? Oh, that's when they give rats 5,000 milligrams a day. Well, wait a second. There's a huge range between 10 milligrams and 5,000 milligrams. I mean, it seems like they're lying to us. And so I decided to dabble with taking more because it felt rather safe. Uh, the medical establishment used to give people 100 milligrams of copper as an emetic to induce vomiting because it's fairly safe and there's just safety studies all over the place. So I felt it was safe, so I took more and that's when the magic started happening. I got all my energy back at 20 to 30 milligrams. I started healing all my arthritis. Uh, my brain came alive, uh, I got smarter. My memory started working better. I had loads of energy after working out. Um, my workouts, suddenly I was super far stronger than before. I just kind of was stuck at uh, squatting a hundred pounds and I went all the way up to 200 pounds in like a month and doing 20 reps with 200 pounds. I was just like a monster in the gym. I felt like I couldn't create any delayed onset muscle soreness at all in the gym. I could work out hard for an hour and I wouldn't be mentally exhausted for the next five hours. I could sit down and write an article and that's exactly what I did. I sat down and wrote this huge article in about a day or two of what my experience was like on copper. And I said, copper is the missing nutrient on the high iodine protocol. That's what I wrote. And I thought it would change the world. And of course, it went over like a lead balloon because people don't really write, uh, read articles that much. And um, so I said, well, uh, maybe I should write the book. And about three years later, I uh, started sitting down and compiled all my notes into a book. It took me about a year to write the book. I was just doing more and more research. And then... Uh, now we've got a 519 page book on copper out and it's now people are really taking notice about everything that copper does. And I could talk about that next. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, <coughs> excuse me. So let's kind of start at the beginning and just tell us, I guess a little bit more about copper as far as why it's important, what it does in the body uh, I mean, you don't have to go in depth physiology necessarily, but just kind of in general, what it does in the body and why we need copper. I'm going to go over about nine or 10 big things that it does. But in chapter one of my book, I cover almost 200 things that it does in the body. Uh, the first big thing that most people find when, because we have a Facebook group now and there's 12,000 people in the group, um, most people find that copper detoxes them. They have all sorts of detox symptoms because copper detoxes, um, well, along with the, the iodine program and along with zinc and along with vitamin C, it just detoxes everything. So the big things that detoxes, I think, are um, fluoride and bromide, um, even vitamin A. Uh, copper and uh, vitamin A move inversely in the liver. And there's more new research coming out saying that uh, vitamin A is a toxin. Um, so it really just detoxes everything with um, making metallothionines. It detoxes mercury and people are, are curing their mercury illnesses. Uh, it kills germs. So there people are, you know, getting cured from Lyme. Um, uh, copper heals the nerves and the brain in like 16 different ways. So everyone says their brain fog goes away because also it kills mold and kills bacteria. 
Um, copper gives us ATP for energy. It's needed um, to turn literally oxygen and food into energy. Um, a lot of people are noticing all their antihistamine problems are going away if they take enough zinc with the copper because copper is an antihistamine, but zinc is a stronger antihistamine. So in combination, they work very well. Uh, zinc and copper make a family of enzymes called the metallothionines, and one of those is superoxide dismutase, which detoxes nearly everything. And metallothionines, they detox uh, arsenic, mercury, and um, lead, and cadmium. Uh, but superoxide dismutase detoxes um, hundreds of chemical toxins. Um, I've discovered we need to keep copper, zinc, and vitamin C in balance because all three are needed to make collagen. So it fixes people's joints. Uh, you need collagen in your bones. Your bones are like 35% collagen. Your muscles are 30% collagen. Uh, we need collagen just for the wrinkles and it makes copper is needed for the pigment and for hair color. Um, the copper boosts and increases red and white blood cell counts. Copper, along with the other minerals, because they detoxify us and the toxins screw with our hormones too. Uh, copper directly boosts hormones, including DHEA and testosterone, but zinc is a better testosterone maker than copper is. Um, it's just an overall healer, just like zinc is. There's slow wound healing if you're low in zinc and copper. Copper is a historic cure for ulcers. It's great for the lungs. It's great for every single organ in the, organ in the human body. Copper literally cures everything, almost because everyone is copper deficient in our modern society. Um, it kills, it, sorry, copper cures um, all the things that kill people, like the top 15 out of the top 15 things people die from on the CDC's lists, including, you know, can't the big, the big ones like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, and everything. And in fact, I looked at all the things that copper does, and I compared it with all of the different top 50 medicines. And uh, copper is a viable substitute for 48 out of the top 50 prescription medicines that are being prescribed. So it does a lot. Hmm. Where did this idea come from? Cop copper is bad. Uh, and, and maybe the general public out there doesn't know that or think that, but me going through medical school and stuff, you know, you always think of that copper, especially copper supplementation is you know, potentially dangerous and, uh, you know, people with high copper are going to get neurological disease and stuff like that. I mean, where, where did all that come from? I think that view is more common than you might think prescribe. She took a two milligram copper pill and cut it in half because she wanted to avoid copper toxicity. And, uh, so I think where that can't comes from is, uh, is, uh, hard to say exactly, but I've pinpointed two potential, uh, uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Number one is uh, Wilson's disease is said, I say said because uh, they still can't cure Wilson's disease, so they really don't know, said to be a disease of high copper. But it's really, it's a gene that's turned off and the body doesn't process copper very well. Um, but copper metabolism gets disrupted through toxins. And copper, since it detoxifies toxins, when we take more copper, it tends to fix those problems. So copper is said to be a problem in uh, people with Wilson's disease and they have liver disease. But Wilson's disease is super rare. It's like one in 200,000 people or one in 30,000 people, depending on if you're counting people who are out there and have never gotten diagnosed. Um, it's a very rare disease and it's said to be genetic. But again, just because it's on the genes doesn't really mean that it's inherited because there's a lot of things on the genes that can get cured with copper because the genes turn off in copper deficiency to preserve copper in the body. I mean, if we didn't have copper in the body for ATP, I think we'd probably all die. So the body starts conserving copper in copper deficiency. And a lot of the things that copper would otherwise do stop because uh, you can't use copper as a detoxer to carry toxins out if you're in copper deficiency mode and the body is preserving copper for things like ATP function, for example. So all those genes turn off and then they turn back on when you get enough copper. So copper does so much more for us when we get more copper than we need. And again, because copper is a detoxifier, it can't be toxic by itself because copper carries with it the capacity to detoxify itself. So in the studies, if people take more than 10 milligrams of copper for a month, the body detoxifies it and kicks almost all of it out. And so there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at that and say, well, that's proof that the body doesn't want copper. Or you can look at that and say, oh, 
that's proof that it doesn't build up, can't be toxic, and it's the perfect detoxifying mechanism. It depends on how much research you do. Uh, it depends on the conclusion you might reach. And I think people sometimes jump to conclusions that aren't warranted by the data, maybe because they're paid to, who knows. Um, but because copper detoxes fluoride, for example, and since they're fluoridating us, it, this might be a political hot button. As a physician, you know, we always want to test for stuff um, and, and do blood work and whatnot. Um, is there a way to know objectively that you are low in copper? Uh, you know, I know we can test for a lot of things, but some minerals like magnesium, uh, for an example, is just difficult to test in the blood. I mean, the serum magnesium levels are just not accurate. Um, is, is copper one of those, or is there a good reliable test out there that would show your copper status? So the government and numerous researchers say that there's no good valid biomarkers or tests to determine if we are copper deficient or, or not. Um, and part of the problem is that in copper deficiency, copper in the blood goes up uh, a lot. Uh, in, in inflammation, copper in the blood goes up because the body's trying to mobilize copper to fight the inflammation and copper is anti-inflammatory. So if there is inflammation and the copper is high in the blood, it's only because the body's trying to mobilize copper to fix the problem, but it still doesn't have enough copper to fix it. So what happens in this copper deficiency high in the blood state, if you start taking copper, it, your body finally gets enough to fix the problem and then it comes back down. Copper in the blood comes back down. So therefore blood is not a good indicator. And in fact, this is, some, this is partly why we have the idea of copper deficiency is that um, copper in the blood has been tested by people like at the Walsh Institute and they've determined that, well, high copper in the blood is correlated with all these problems, but all the problems are essentially copper deficiency problems. So they never seem to bother to check whether or not their conclusions were matched by the data or whether other people's opinions on whether or not those copper tests were valid, they never, they never did that. Um, so sometimes people believe their own research more than other people's and they, they get lost and, and, and deceived by how the body presents. For example, also uh, copper's in the blood 100% more in pregnant women. Um, this does not mean that they're copper toxic. Uh, the copper needs to go to the baby. That's why it's elevated. And in fact, babies pound for pound have five to 10 times more copper in their bodies than adults do. And adults are routinely all depleted. So. Um, and the other thing, like I said before, is if we're taking 10 milligrams of copper a day and then we're washing all the copper out, well, it could very well be that even, I, even me, if I'm taking 30 milligrams of copper and applying 70 milligrams to my skin every day for a total of 100, I could still be copper depleted because my body should be just washing it all out and using it as a detoxifying agent. Now, sure, I, I, I must have some built, built up to, for basic needs and some for basic storage, but if I were to suddenly stop taking copper for two to three days, I would probably quickly slip into deficiency because my body's very good at excreting it now. And it might overdo it. And it would have to shut down everything that it does as soon as I run out. So even I could still be deficient in copper. So without a test, how does, uh, I'm assuming a copper deficiency is just a clinical diagnosis, meaning we just go on symptoms. Right. Uh, you list a lot of uh, symptoms uh, that, uh, uh, you know, due to a copper deficiency, but what are some of the major ones? If somebody is copper deficient, what are some of the major yeah. symptoms they would have? Well, usually the medical establishment catches copper deficiency after people have such severe nerve damage that they're wheelchair bound and they start detecting lesions on the spinal cord where the myelination on the, the myelin sheaths have all been corroded and come apart so people can no longer even walk. And then they finally test for copper deficiency. And in that late stage, it shows up as copper deficient in blood. Um, so that's beyond the stage where copper starts getting elevated and into the stage where it's fully depleted again. So in that sense, those tests can work. There's another test, um, the urine test. Uh, one of the guys on our forum said that he was depleted in copper for eight months on copper at 10 milligrams. And it was only in the nine month at 10 milligrams that he finally had any detectable copper in his urine at all. Um, I'm not sure how valid of a test that would be for the general population. Um, most studies say that there's really not a whole lot of copper that even comes out in the urine. And I don't know how easy it is to 
find a test that would do that. Um, but again, if you know, if most people are are copper deficient, I, I just don't know how valid that test would be. Gotcha. So uh, if if most people are copper deficient, I mean, what what are the main symptoms going to be uh, of All right. copper, so, copper deficiency? So in severe copper deficiency, that you know, the nerve damage. Um, for mild copper deficiency, you'd have all sorts of things like arthritis and aneurysms and uh, you know, warts or fungal infections or um, heavy metal toxicity, difficulty uh, detoxifying, food allergies. Um, I mean, it just presents as so many things: diabetes, insulin insensitivity, heart disease is copper deficiency, uh, joint pain, arthritis. I think I've said that again. So just, I mean, almost all the major conditions that people have are copper deficiency. Like I said. Uh, the top 50 prescription medicines, copper is a viable substitute. So if you're taking any prescription medicine, uh, it's probably because you're copper deficient. And as well, uh, any medicine, any toxin is going to detoxify copper because the body will use up copper to detoxify things first until it can no longer do so. And then you're already copper deficient because your, your copper detoxification mechanisms are, are suddenly broken when you're, when you're putting toxins into the body instead of copper. Okay. Well, let's talk about, you may have mentioned this somewhat, but talk about why so many people are copper deficient today. Yes. Yeah, so our, our food supply, uh, say 70 years ago, used to provide about five milligrams of copper per day for people. Um, and people weren't as poisoned back then. Um, for the last 75 years now, they've been putting fluoride in the water supply and fluoride is going to lower copper. Um, there's most, the average body, the average person has 2,600 milligrams of fluoride in the body and only 70 milligrams of copper. Um, the next most popular toxin in the body is bromide, which is now 1,500 milligrams of bromide in the average person. And that also lowers copper. Um, so the, the average person today is only getting 0 0.6 milligrams of copper or less in the diet. So we're getting less than a 10th of what we used to. Plus, you add in all these other toxins that people are getting and storing away in their bodies. Um, I think there's like five or six toxins that are uh, equal to, they're all nerve toxins that are equal to or higher than the amount of copper in the average person's body, like lead. Most people have the equivalent amount of lead in their body as copper, and lead is horrible for us. And you know how you detox lead? Copper. <laughs> we need copper, zinc, and selenium to make the metallothionines to detoxify lead. So most people aren't getting nearly enough copper to de just detoxify lead let alone all these other toxins like aluminum and the mercury and the arsenic and uh, bromide and fluoride. So, yeah. Okay. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. I said at the beginning, before we started recording, uh, I had hit a lot of the symptoms of a copper deficiency, including, you know, some fatigue, not sleeping that great. Uh, and as I look at some of the causes that you mentioned in your book, it makes a lot of sense because I have a, a sauna. So I sweat all the time in the sauna. I work out you extremely can lose an, uh, easily one milligram or more of copper a day in the sweat. And if you're only getting 0 0.6 milligrams per day yeah. in your food, you can see that that would be a recipe for copper deficiency. Right. Yeah. On top of that, I work out very hard. Of course, I'm sweating yep. more there. Um, and, and, uh, you know, and, and then of course, uh, up until recently, we now have a, a, whole house uh, water filter but prior to that uh, i know that our water was very high in fluoride and so anyway i was checking checking a lot of boxes there so it makes sense oh, that i very well could be depleted in I, that so I, I researched you a little bit before the show and i saw that you work out and lift a lot and um i do too and have you ever heard of the thing called uh, central nervous system fatigue from lifting mm -hmm. yeah yeah well that could very well be copper deficiency mm-hmm from yeah. lifting heavy because we need copper for growth of muscles. So uh, I think athletes need a lot more copper than average. Um, and you'll notice uh, oh, the other thing I, I found in the research is that fast growth will deplete copper. So, you know, bodybuilders who take testosterone, they get the fast growth, but they are making testosterone without the building block of copper. So what happens to a lot of the bodybuilders these days who are taking the steroids? They're, they're dropping dead left and right from heart disease or heart failure. And um, that could very well be from copper deficiency. Um, the researcher, the government researcher, Cleve, says that there are 80 bar biomarkers that are similar in copper deficient rats that are also found in humans with heart disease. 80 similarities. 
So that shows that heart disease is copper deficiency. And I could see why that would afflict uh, weightlifters on, on testosterone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we, you know, we do a lot of uh, what we call therapeutic um, uh, testosterone. I'm um, sure it's at much lower levels in the bodybuilders. Right. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so we're still in, in kind of more normal ranges, just upper ends of normal, you know, but, but we call it hormone optimization. Uh, Mm -hmm. but with that, you know, one of the things testosterone, you know, literally nobody in the modern era is getting any normal amount of copper. We used to get five milligrams 70 years ago. Now we're Mm -hmm. getting, you know, 0.6. So we're all almost every, that's why I think almost everybody is struggling with copper deficiency, just, gotcha. you know, just what's in the food. And then, gosh, even glyphosate depletes copper. It's a copper uh, chelator. It binds to copper. Hmm. So plants are picking up less from the soil if glyphosate's used in the, and it is. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, so one of the things, I don't know if you mentioned it in your book or, um, you know, I was telling you before we started recording, I was reading another uh, uh, book, which uh, another guy I'm going to be interviewing in the future, but um, he was talking about uh, iron storage and yes. how that that's due to a, a copper deficiency because the, the copper, uh, you know, is supposed to be uh, kind of uh, taking the iron out. And, and so, I guess talk a little bit about that, if you will, or you don't have to go into detail in that, but, but what's the connection there with copper and, and iron? So first of all, I'll say this, this other man's name, his, his name is uh, Morley Robbins. And uh, I've read part of his book and he runs this root cause protocol. And uh, he recommends taking small amounts of copper. And I recommend taking large amounts of copper. Uh, He and I speak on occasion because we have each written a book on copper. Um, so his view is that, and I share a lot of his views on this subject, and that is that, uh, you know, we definitely need copper to mobilize iron, because if I, if you remember what I said earlier, with copper, we have more red uh, blood cells. In fact, we get on copper, we get above average. So if we get above average, mm, I think that's it puts, puts, putting us back into a, a healthy range, and it's kind of going to show that just about everybody has at least a mild um, anemia going on because we are, get our red and white blood cells higher than normal on copper. In fact, one of the guys in our forum, and this is, I'm going off the subject a little bit here. Um, he got his white blood cell count so high that they assumed he would, had an infection because that's how doctors test for infections is high white, white blood cell count. And then he, he went on an antibiotic because he didn't want to have to explain that it was from the copper. <laughs> um, so we need copper to keep iron in solution and copper sulfate helps keep iron in solution even better because even the sulfur binds the iron and l- puts it into liquid suspension. Um, so uh, copper and zinc and sulfur and even I think potassium all help to keep iron more mobilized. Um, with more copper, we make more cereloplasmin, we make more transferritin, the proteins that help to carry both iron uh, and copper around the body. Um, so uh, morally posited that most iron deficiency is really all just copper deficiency. Uh, but I am aware that there's also some B vitamin anemia deficiencies as well. So anemia can be from low B vitamins as well as uh, low copper. Um, you know, it, iron deficiency only really happens, I think, if people suffer a tremendous amount of bleeding. Um, Uh, Morley's theory is that uh, the average person has about um, one milligram of iron per day that they have been alive, which for a 52-year-old man like me implies that I would have about 15,000 milligrams of uh, iron in my body or 18,000. But the point is, I'm also a bleeder. So I've bled a lot during my lifetime. So I might be lower iron than, say, the average person or women if they have really heavy periods they can uh, be lower in iron than, say, the average person. Depends on how much we bleed, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so I guess probably what everybody wants to know, so uh, almost everyone can relate with some of these symptoms that you could point back to a copper deficiency. And and so, uh, you know, everyone wants to know, well, how do, how do I fix it? How do I treat, you know, a copper deficiency? And so you're pretty aggressive. So we'll kind of talk about your protocol. Um, and I mentioned before we started recording that uh, I've read enough just recently that that I wanted to start trying copper. So I started pretty conservative, conservatively using a, a copper glycinate at three milligrams a day, just started mm-hmm. that. Um, okay. So 
give us some advice on just the kind of the the general population out there that maybe like me, you know, this sure. overall pretty healthy, but just wants to mm -hmm. optimize what's maybe the right. best best place to start with copper, and then maybe uh, go from there as far as if people want to push the limit a, a little bit, um, right, and, and maybe get up to to where you're at. So. I want to talk about two analogies before I talk about copper. And the first is um, iodine and the second is boron. Uh, very briefly on boron, uh, I'll get back to iodine and then get back to copper. Very briefly on boron. Um, it, the soils in Jamaica give the average person less than one milligram of boron in their diets. And they have the highest incidence of arthritis at about 70%. Boron's great for arthritis, by the way. In the United States, we get about one to three milligrams of boron per day in our diets from the soil. And the incidence of arthritis here is about 30%. And in Israel, they get about uh, five to eight milligrams of uh, boron in their diets from the boron in their soils, and uh, they have almost no arthritis. However, so this kind of implies that we need at least, you know, five to eight milligrams of boron per day. However, people in Israel have been getting that their whole lives. If so, we are playing catch up. <laughs> the minimum we need for boron is really nine to 20 milligrams to start reversing things like arthritis. And it begins to do that in about three weeks. But then there's the other problem of um, fluoride because boron also detoxes fluoride and fluoride also causes arthritis. So to get past the fluoride symptoms from taking just boron, you have to take boron up to about 100 milligrams to get through the fluoride detox point and we know this because on 20 milligrams, people don't get past the anxiety point because taking boron makes them too anxious. And the anxiety is from fluoride detox. But if they get up to 100 milligrams, then they power through the fluoride detox. They're no longer anxious, anxious and then they're calm. So, and then with iodine, the high iodine doctors, they discovered that um, 12 milligrams of iodine is the equivalent of what you would get in a Japanese diet. So they figured that would be good. But then they discovered it took a year to reach saturation, again, partly because maybe it takes a while to detox fluoride. And they, they determined saturation by how much uh, iodine a person's body could hold. So um, the average person would absorb 50% of an uh, iodine dose in the beginning. And then after they reach saturation, they're excreting 90% of it, going to show that uh, iodine is easily excreted and works as a detox agent. And it would take a whopping one year to reach iodine saturation at 12 milligrams, but only three months at 50 milligrams. So the high iodine doctors began recommending 50 milligrams, which was kind of close to a historic amount of about say, I don't know, 35 milligrams of iodine in the form of Lugols. Um, so with that as a sort of a background, I realized I should probably be taking 20 to 30 milligrams of copper too, just to help get me past the fluoride problems. And sure enough, when I started taking more copper, I got nauseated. And it took me a while to get past the nausea problem, um, partly because copper must detox fluoride in a slightly different way than the other two things do, like boron and iodine, which also detox fluoride. So for most people, I would say work up to 10 to, tw you know, 10 to 20 to 30 milligrams, but it's gonna take a while. It's helpful if you take some of these other minerals. You have to slowly adjust. Um, half of people get nauseated on copper at a mere three milligrams. And I think that's the fluoride talking. Um, they've done studies that show half of the people get nauseated and that's what it's like in our forum. So we tell people, look, take uh, two milligrams, three times a day to get up to six milligrams, but spread them out. Take two milligrams in the morning, two milligrams in the afternoon, two milligrams in the early evening and take it with milk because if you take it with milk, it reduces nausea. So if you take the individual dose down to two milligrams and take it with milk to reduce the nausea, you're reducing nausea in two different ways, but you're getting an overall dose that's enough to actually do something six milligrams. And from there, you can slowly increase as you can tolerate it. But hey, six milligrams is enough to do significant detox. People are passing parasites. They're needing more zinc to handle the histamine reactions. Uh, people are curing MCAS, an incurable condition called mast cell activation syndrome, just with uh, you know uh, copper and zinc and vitamin C. We need all three of those just for collagen formation and to stop bleeding. So one of the other problems that happens on high copper is that people develop headaches. 
but the vitamin C makes the headache go away in as little as five minutes. So that's what we got to do. You got to slowly introduce the copper and take it in balanced amounts with zinc and vitamin C. So our zinc balance ratio that we're using is about two to one or one to one zinc to copper. So twice as much zinc to copper or maybe equal amounts. And really people only need a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, whether they're beginning or whether they're experts, you don't have to ramp that one up because it seems like in the beginning, people are detoxing more. But later at higher doses, once you're past the detox, you really just don't need that much vitamin C. You just need the same, same old, same old thousand milligrams, standard amount of vitamin C works. So, uh, you know, too much of a, of a good thing is not a good thing. I mean, just like we were talking about testosterone, you know, I, I do testosterone optimization, but too much testosterone, right. like, you know, the bodybuilders, you know, that's, that's not right. healthy. Uh, yeah, so we found that too much copper will deplete vitamin C. So you have to take it because we need all three to stop bleeding. So how do, how does one know if they're like me who just kind of started pretty conservatively, I started with three milligrams of copper a day. And if I want to build that up, uh, you know, work up to six milligrams and 10 milligrams, like, how do we know, uh, where to get to that we're kind of hitting that, that healthy mark? Well, let's say three milligrams after about a month or two, if you just kept it at three, you might begin to develop headaches if you weren't taking any vitamin C at all. That's kind of been my experience watching people in the forum and paying attention to things. Or if you weren't taking any zinc at all and you started sneezing all the time, that's the uh, common antihistamine response from detoxing fluoride and things, or even bromide that uh, zinc helps to calm that down. So you know, that might hit, that really only hits people. I think the sneezing only hits people at around up to six to 10 milligrams of copper if they're not taking any zinc. So okay, um, it doesn't really hit at the three milligram mark. I think at the three milligram mark, you're, you're really safe. I mean, that your, your average copper supplements at three milligrams for a reason. And it's probably because your average person can't tolerate any more unless they have gone through the tremendous research I've done to know which are the co-nutrients you're going to need so and i want to ask more specifically about the vitamin c and the zinc here in a minute but but sure. sticking with copper like how do i know if i need to, i just started taking three milligrams a day um how do i know if i need if i'm going to do better at six milligrams or am i going to do better at 10 milligrams i mean you know what what should my goal be what should i be uh, looking for well, so some people, theoretically, when they start copper, they have real problems because, you know, it's possible to have an imbalance whereby you, you naturally have a little bit more copper in your body than zinc. Or, you know, if you're low vitamin C, taking copper that's going to deplete those two other things, if you're already depleted in those other things, you're going to feel it and you're going to feel awful for whatever, whatever way that manifests. And that's, that's, a, that's a rare possibility. Um, but almost everybody's low in copper. So that's not that common. Um, and as far as how, how do you know whether you'll feel better? I mean, we have so many testimonials from people who say that they just feel better on copper because, you know, they get energy and their brain works better and they're clearing out, you know, uh, germs and uh, mold and killing, you know, it's just the testimonials are like a guide that kind of tell us that, most people do best at around say 15 to 30 milligrams of copper. Okay. So if, if some, if somebody wants to try copper, like your recommendation is like slowly titrate up right. and, and also try to balance these other ones, but slow, yeah. like, don't, don't just start taking three milligrams. I mean, you know, work, work your way up right. um, and, and to get to a, a higher dose. I mean, that's your recommendation for most people. It is the recommendation for most people because most people are copper deficient. And as we take more copper, uh, you know, the studies, the studies that have been done, people uh, were like short, the short term studies <clears throat> where they put people on copper for about two months or three months at 10 milligrams, or they put them on, on 20 milligrams of copper for a month and a half. And for healthy people, no problems are reported. But for the unhealthy people, <laughs> They typically have more toxins. And what I have found is that, that the harder it is to tolerate copper is almost the greater proof that you need it. And the greater the testimonial will be when you can finally tolerate it. Because the only reasons why people can't tolerate are 
they're filled with toxins or they're low in vitamin C and zinc and the other minerals. So as they detoxify and get those other minerals up, they fix just about everything. I mean, it, it really feels like just about everything is, is a combination of toxicity and deficiency of these minerals. And all these minerals, they, they aid in the detox. So they go hand in hand. Gotcha. All right. So back to the zinc and the vitamin C. Yes. Uh, how do we balance that? Because I don't know if it was uh, in your book or Morley's book that talks about how vitamin C and zinc can actually lower copper. Right. Um, and so how do we how do we take, you know, vitamin C uh, and zinc and it not lower copper? And then the second part right. of that question is I know he uh, he discourages synthetic vitamin C or ascorbic acid That's right. recommends like whole food vitamin C. Uh, right. and, and so where, where are you at on all that? So in almost, so I have identified 45 antagonists and I know there's a lot more because almost every single toxin that exists in the world will antagonize and lower copper because the body will like to use copper to detoxify everything. Um, but the 45 antagonists I identified in my book that have been identified in research that I can point research studies on, it's almost always these substances will deplete copper in the average person who's only getting 0.6 milligrams or less in their diet. So, you know, if you take 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C, it might lower copper a little bit and take quite a bit of time to really induce copper deficiency. Um, I mean, people can tolerate literally 100 grams of vitamin C in an IV short term and be just fine and claim that and, and think that they're just fine. Uh, Andrew Saul, who's a big proponent of vitamin C, he said, yeah, well, if vitamin C, if vitamin C depleted minerals, we'd be dead. <laughs> but I have to look at him and go, yeah, well, dude, you have white hair, like bleach white hair, and you're not that much older than me. So maybe, you know, that white hair is, and it is a sign of your, you know, low copper. Linus Pauling also had very white hair. Some of, a lot of these guys have very white hair who are vitamin C advocates. So I think there's something to that, that they're lowering their copper and they're just in a little bit denial about it. Um, but on the other hand, look, it's probably a very small effect. And it only happens when people are taking 0.6 milligrams or essentially no copper. When you take 30 milligrams of copper, I'm taking so much more that the, the vitamin C is not blocking it. I'm still getting all the, all the benefits. Uh, my joints feel great. Uh, my flat feet aren't bothering me when I walk or run or sprint. Um, my joints have never felt better in the gym. I'm really detoxing fluoride. I can feel that. Uh, how is it my joints keep, continue to get better and better every year and I'm 52? The copper's working for me, even though I'm taking vitamin C, even though I'm taking a lot of zinc, I'm taking you know, 50 to 75 milligrams of zinc. Um, but that's only a two to one ratio over the copper that I'm taking, or maybe even a one to one ratio, if you, you know, include the topical copper I'm taking. So again, the, the antagonistic effects of almost everything apply only when you're not taking any copper. And when you start taking large amounts of copper, you overcome all of the antagonistic problems. And really the synergy starts kicking in because you know, the body, like uh, copper and zinc are both necessary ingredients in the superoxide dismutase molecule. molecule. It, it literally contains copper and zinc, can't be made without them. Uh, collagen can't be made without both. So, you know, if you start taking one of an essential building block, but you need the other, you're going to run out of the other if your body starts making collagen. And that's what starts happening. Uh, people's wrinkles start going away, their joints start repairing, you know, all that requires collagen, and that's why there's sort of an antagonism because, you know, you're going to use up these things as your body heals. Gotcha. Now, do you take your vitamin C at different times of the day? Like, do you take your copper in the morning, vitamin C middle day, you know, zinc at night? How do you kind of balance that? So um, as far as timing goes, I want to em emphasize that you can always take everything with everything. And there's no chance that it's going to ruin its effect. However, if you take absolutely everything, when you're taking a ton of things, there's a much greater chance of nausea and vomiting, and that's not good. So the, the two that, are, that cause the most nausea and vomiting are uh, copper and zinc. So I like to take copper in the morning because copper sort of gives us energy for the day. And I like to take zinc at night because zinc is a great um, uh, sleep aid. 
helps calm us down. Zinc is even more powerful for that than calcium uh, or magnesium, which are also calming minerals. But you, do, you can't, we can take them at the same time. If, I, if I'm having extra sneezing, for example, which I know, know is a histamine reaction, I'll take more uh, zinc in the day. Or if I want a more vivid dream at night and I want to make sure that my brain is getting copper it needs to heal, I'll take a, a milk at night with copper and iodine. And man, then the vivid dreams will really kick in because they're great, great nerve healers, copper and iodine. Mm -hmm. and, and what's your thought on the ascorbic acid versus the whole food vitamin C? Does it make a difference? So we have tried Morley's recommendations on taking lower zinc to make sure we're maximizing our copper. Um, I took zinc all the way down to 10 milligrams for a while. Um, but sometimes it takes a while to induce a deficiency. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'm able to get, get by with 10 milligrams of, of zinc with my 100 milligrams of copper. But very quickly, I started having allergic reactions like all the time. So it took me, a, you know, I had to bump the zinc back up. I bumped it up to 30 milligrams. So I, I'm like, oh, that might be enough. And then the allergies came back. I had to bump it up to about 75 milligrams to 100 milligrams for a couple of weeks and then I was able to settle back down to 50 to 75 milligrams of zinc. So we have tried Morley's advice and on our high copper program, we definitely need more zinc. And as far as the vitamin C goes, um, I tried the uh, whole food C and whole food C is very popular because Morley is very popular. So a lot of people have tried the whole food C on our high copper program and they say they just get headaches. And I said, well, try the ascorbic acid form. And universally people are like, oh, the ascorbic acid form totally worked. So I don't exactly know why. I have some theories, um, but, I, but uh, if AA works, ascorbic acid, if, it's, if that's working, we should do what works. Um, so maybe the reason why whole food C doesn't work so well is because there's so many other plant concentrates in with it. And plant things are generally demineralizers, Maybe they are higher in oxalates. I mean, I don't really know what the reason why is. I just don't, I just know that the whole food seed doesn't work for us on our high copper program. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, you were talking about boron and iodine and then zinc mm -hmm. and copper and vitamin C. And, and I don't want people to get too overwhelmed here by thinking, oh my right. God, like, you know, how am I going to take all this stuff? And do right. I, do I, do I take it all at once? And so right. give us, so if, if somebody out there is not on anything, so they're, they're not on any, uh, right. copper supplementation, they're not on, uh, zinc, iodine, boron, uh, give us a, a, a step one, day one, yeah. you know, start, start this, you know, or week one, month one, and then add, mm -hmm. add this and then add this kind of, kind of summarize all that, if you would, to, sure. uh, in kind of a working knowledge. Sure. So in our quick start guide, we also have a stages guide where we kind of walk people through the minerals of which ones they should be adding next. I think it's safe to take copper in three milligrams by itself for a good two weeks without needing anything else. By then you're, you might start needing some vitamin C and some zinc by the end of two weeks. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next ones to add are probably the B vitamins. Uh, I think high copper can induce eventually some niacin deficiency as well as potentially a molybdenum deficiency. Those are the other two that we, we mentioned um, that copper can deplete. Um, potassium is good for helping absorb copper. Calcium is good for absorbing copper. Citrus and meat are also good for absorbing copper. And surprisingly, zinc is good for absorbing copper. They did studies and show that um, <clears throat> at 13 milligrams of zinc, more copper was absorbed when people are only taking, say, 1.3 milligrams of copper uh, than at other levels of zinc. So if you go take the zinc too high, it blocks it. If you have too low, it blocks it in copper. So again, there's a synergy there. Um, I don't know that I'm getting off of your question, but the point is uh, people are often too scared and nervous by the antagonists. And you don't have to be. I mean, we're we're doing everything as cautious as possible to make sure that we're not taking so much copper that it could block these other things. So that's why we just take everything to pre do prevent um, inducing any other deficiencies, which we know can be a problem. Okay. You said you kind of have a quick start guide or whatever. Is that on your website or is that in your book or? Yeah, so in our forum, we have the quick start guide. Oh, okay. uh, the quick start guide was developed after the publication of the book to try to 
meet most people's concerns. It includes more than just telling people to take zinc and vitamin C. It's about 2,500 words by now. Like sometimes if people ramp up copper too quickly, they can get lower back pain and kidney pain. And what happens is this happens the same with boron and iodine too. If people ramp those up too quickly because all three detox fluoride. And if you detox fluoride too fast, the fluoride can clog the kidneys. And a great way to clear the fluoride out of the kidneys is to take a little bit of baking soda, uh, an eighth of a teaspoon of baking soda. Usually once in a large cup of water will eliminate that as a problem. Little other problems can come up too, like uh, bleeding problems. So I have a stop bleeding guide. And usually the bleeding problem is happens because people aren't taking the right form of vitamin C, or they're not taking a thousand milligrams, or maybe they uh, haven't had any greens or they uh, aren't doing some cayenne pepper, other things that could stop bleeding. Or sometimes people, if they're transitioning off of iron or off of medicines, they get air hunger. And we've discovered that bumping up the zinc prevents the air hunger. So little problems like that or little indications take more or less of other nutrients. Um, neck rash, that is pellagra. That is niacin deficiency. Occasionally people are on copper for about three months. They said, ah, I finally developed the neck rash. I'm like, well, you, you should have started the B vitamins by now. <laughs> so yes, take your niacin, take all of the good B vitamins. We've identified some that we don't think are as good. Like B6, we think B6 might be a nerve toxin. Okay. Um, so uh, you didn't mention anything uh, about magnesium. I know, you know Morley uh, talks about magnesium, and that's a supplement that I usually advocate a, a lot of is magnesium. I feel like most people are magnesium deficient. So they are. what what's your recommendation on magnesium? So um, copper and boron both help the body retain magnesium, but most people are not on copper and boron. So most people are in a state of magnesium wasting. In other words, they just can't take enough magnesium. After about four years on copper and boron, we began mm. to realize, oh, you know what? We just, I don't know why we don't seem to ever like taking our magnesium. And then we later learned that copper like boron help us retain so much, we probably don't need any. So we stopped taking our magnesium and we settled in waiting for cramps to hit and they never did because, you know, that's what happens. You get cramps in your body here and there if you don't get any magnesium, but that never happened to us. So we've been now uh, no magnesium for about the past, oh, six to eight months, and we're doing just fine. So it's very surprising to me that we're, we can survive as health nuts without magnesium because it's so universally prescribed. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. So copper helps the sold on magnesium and salt. So gosh, we were eating out a lot and we were taking salt as a supplement because salt is indicated also on a high iodine program because the chlorides actually help to detox bromide. But um, we learned that uh, potassium is the better salt and that potassium helps to keep salt in check. And with salt sort of naturally rising with copper through the uh, production of aldosterone, we stopped our salt supplement and started feeling a little bit better too. Another minor tweak. Okay. Uh so uh, you can you can buy. So I want to ask what type of copper supplement you recommend. Uh, the copper glycinate that I got was fairly cheap, although um, I know yeah. you do something at the house that's really really cheap. And so uh, yeah. talk about just kind of what you do and what kind of copper supplementation you recommend. Sure. So we we took the copper biz glycinate for the first three years on our high copper experimentation life right and then when i noticed that i it was hard to find and it wasn't always available even at amazon it was running out or amazon takes a while to deliver it we were running out i was spending you know 40 to 50 bucks a month on copper and i realized in writing the book and doing all my research that uh, all these studies are studying copper sulfate this is what all the researchers use so i'm like copper sulfate well, let me look into that. I found that it was super cheap. You can get a 10 pound bag of copper sulfate for 30 bucks. So I ordered, my, I ordered myself some and did the calculations on figuring out how many milligrams it would require to uh, put in a two ounce dropper bottle. And it's like, well, you, copper sulfate is 25% copper. So if I want um, a one milligram per drop solution, there's about 1,100 milligram uh, drops in a, in a bottle, a two ounce dropper bottle. 
So if you multiply that times four, you get uh, 4.7 grams. So we measure out 4.7 grams. Turns out that that's five eighths of a teaspoon. So we put five eighths of a teaspoon of copper sulfate powder or uh, blue crystals into a two ounce dropper bottle. We add some boiling distilled water. So it dissolves easy, makes the least amount of sediment. And then that uh, makes us a one milligram per drop solution. And the amount of copper sulfate in that is literally three cents a bottle. And that bottle will last, well, it lasts us only about uh, uh, 11 days because we're doing about 100 milligrams a day. So, yeah, hmm. three cents. It saves money tremendously. Okay. Uh, now, is that little recipe, I know it's probably in your book, is that on the website anywhere or on your Facebook group? It's, or? it's on the book. It's in the Facebook group. It's in the Quick Start Guide. It's it's everywhere to make sure that people know that, that where it is and that they can find it. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, well, I guess we probably need to wrap up here. Anything else you want to throw out there about copper that I didn't ask? Oh, there was one thing that hit me. Um, so, oh gosh, I, I was like, nah, it does 200 things. You know, it, it heals everything. That's all you really need to know. It will take your health to the next level. You'll feel so much better. People say it improves their emotions, gives them patience, gives them joy for the first time in years. Uh, you know, when you detoxify all these things uh, and you give uh, the, the nerves, the nutrients it needs to thrive and rebuild the myelin sheath and to make neurotransmitters and to make energy, you just will feel so much better in so many ways. It's, it's countless. Uh, just detoxing fluoride alone is, is one of the 200 ways that copper heals us. But that one thing alone, uh, you know, fluoride causes up to 180 different negative health conditions in the body. And that's just with one toxin. It's probably like that with mercury probably also causes another 200 health conditions. Aluminum causes another 200 different health conditions. You eliminate all of that. You, I mean, you heal the body literally 10,000 different ways by taking copper because everything starts working better and it's synergistic. Mm -hmm. So uh, just real quickly, back to my kind of question earlier, um, uh, what dose do you find that people will start seeing all of those tangible benefits? Right. I mean, is it six milligrams, 10, 10 milligrams, or I'm sure right. it's going to vary from individual. Yeah. Individual. I wrote an article saying, you know, you really need about five to 10 milligrams, but most people are actually getting big benefits at five milligrams, but they then graduate to 10 because of the nausea problem, the detoxification problem. So at five milligrams, people get enough glimpses of more energy that they decide they want more. They get enough glimpses of the better nerve functioning and parasite detoxing. Uh, it's difficult at first to hold at five milligrams for maybe a month, and then they'll move up to 10 on month two. And then by month three, they'll try 15 milligrams. You know, people will move up in those stages because they know it's good, but it's detoxing is rough. The the big trouble I see is that too many people like to dabble with one and two milligrams and they get stuck in a morass of perpetual detox without the benefits. Um, you know, you need to take enough copper to detoxify not only the incoming toxins, but also the existing toxins. So five milligrams is like the sweet spot where you begin to notice the benefits. Okay. For, most, right. for most people, if you're less toxic, maybe three milligrams. I mean, you've been on it for a couple of days, but I mean, you're, you're a healthy guy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, very interesting. Uh, well, okay. So um, the book is called uh, the copper revolution and uh, lots of information in there. People want to just uh, find out more. You have a website uh, called revealing fraud.com. Yes. Uh, and then also you mentioned this Facebook page. What's the name of that Facebook page? You just type in the copper revolution when you're copper searching revolution. Facebook okay. groups and it should come up. Gotcha. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as we close here, I always ask my guests if they could give us Ooh. one health tip that would make us healthier today. Um, <laughs> I have a, feel, a feeling I know what you're going to say, but uh, <laughs> what would you say to that question? You know, I'm not going to say the obvious, which would be to take copper. I'm going to say 
you know, knowledge itself is good, but if you don't apply it, it's worthless. Do it. You have to do it. That's the tip. Okay. A lot of people, they know a lot of things to do, but they just won't do them. And they feel guilty. Start doing the things you know you need to do. That's the biggest health tip of all. Because like I said, synergy, you do one positive thing and it leads to doing another positive thing and it leads to another positive thing. My subtitle, my book is called Healing with Minerals. It's not just copper. You know, you got to do a lot of good things. I also exercise. I also walk. I also drink distilled water. It's a lot of good things that you got to do and get right. And then the health will really bloom. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Um, Well, Mr. Uh, Jason Hommel, uh, certainly appreciate uh, your time and expertise in this subject. Very interesting as I'm just starting to scratch the surface on this. So um, kind of excited, uh, exciting for me. So I appreciate your time and appreciate Greg. uh, Thank you so much for having me on the show, sir. Thank you. And and appreciate everyone listening. And uh, we will talk to you next time. Great. Thank you so much.